I met him first, I say, in 1929, through the intervention of a friend of mine, common friend, who asked Mr. Gandhi to see me, you see. And so Mr. Gandhi wrote to me, saying that he would like to see me. So I went and saw him. That was just before going to the round table conference. And then he came to the second round table conference. Didn't come for the first. And he was there for about five, six months. And there, of course, I met him also and faced him also. You see? Then, at uh, once thereafter, he also, after the signing of the Pune Pact, you see, asked me to come and see him. So I went to see him. He was then in jail. You see? But that's all the time that I have met him. Uh -huh. But um, I always say that as I met Mr. Gandhi in the capacity of an opponent, I have a feeling that I know him better than most other people because he had opened his real fangs to me, you see, and I could see the inside of the man. You see, while others who generally went there as devotees, you see, saw nothing of him except the external appearance which he had put up as a Mahatma, you see. But I saw him in his human capacity, the bare man in him. And so I say that I, I understand him better, you see, than most of, his, most of the people uh, who have associated himself, themselves with him can say. So how would you sum up what you found in him? Well, I, I must say at the outset that I feel quite surprised you see, at the interest is the outside world, Western world particularly, seems to be taking in Mr. Gandhi. I cannot understand that. So far as India is concerned, he was, in my judgment, you see, an episode in the history of India. Never an epoch maker. Gandhi would, has already vanished from the memory of the people in this country. His memory is kept up because the Congress party annually, you see, gives a holiday, either on his birthday <coughs> or some other day connected with some event in his life, and uh, has a celebration every year going on for seven days in a week. Naturally, people's memory is revived. But if these artificial respirations were not given, I think Gandhi would be long, long forgotten. You don't feel then that uh, he fundamentally changed the aspect of... Not at all. Yeah. Not at all. In fact, he was all the time double dealing. He conducted two papers. One in English, the Harijan, you see, and before that, uh, Young India. And in Gujarat, he, he, he conducted another paper, you see, which is called the Deen Bandhu, or something like that. Now, if you read the two papers, you will see how Mr. Gandhi was deceiving the people. In the English paper, he posed himself as an opponent of the caste system and of untouchability, you see, and that he was a Democrat. But if you read his Gujarati magazine, you see, you will see him a more orthodox man. He has been supporting the caste system, the Varnashram Dharma, and all the orthodox uh, dogmas, you see, which has kept India down, you see, all through ages. In fact, somebody ought to write Mr. Gandhi's biography by making a comparative study of the statements made by Mr. Gandhi in his Harijan and the statements made by Mr. Gandhi in his Gujarati paper. So there are seven volumes of it. You see? The people, the Western world only reads, you see, the English paper where Mr. Gandhi, in order to keep himself, you see, in the esteem of the Western people who believe in democracy, was advocating democratic ideals, you see. But you got to see also what he actually taught to the people. 
in his vernacular paper. Nobody seems to have made any reference. All the biographies that have been written of him, you see, are based upon his Harijan, you see, and the young India, but not upon the Gujarati writings of Mr. Gandhi. Then what were his real intentions with regard to the scheduled castes in the structure? Well, he, he only wanted, you see, there are two things about the scheduled caste. We want untouchability to be abolished, you see. But we also want, you see, that we must be given equal opportunities, you see, so that we may rise to the level of the other classes. Mere washing off of untouchability is of no consequence. We have been carrying on with untouchability for the last 2,000 years. Nobody has bothered about it, you see. Nobody has bothered about it. Yes, there are some, uh, some disabilities which are very harmful. For instance, people can't take water, and people can't uh, have land, you see, to cultivate and earn their livelihood. But the other things which are far more important, you see, namely that they should have the same status, you see, in the country, and that they should have the opportunity to hold high offices so that not only their dignity will rise, but also they will get what I call strategic positions from which they could, uh, they could protect their own people. Mr. Gandhi was totally opposed, totally opposed. You see? He was content with things like temple entry. Temple entry, that was all the thing that he wanted to do, you see. You see? Which is a very, nobody cares for temp, Hindu temples now. The untouchables have become, you see, so conscious of the fact that temple going is of no consequence at all. You see, you live in the untouchable quarters, just the same, whether you went into the temple or whether you did not go into the temple. You see, people, just as for instance, people at one time would not allow the untouchables to travel by railways, you see, because of pollution, you see. But now they don't mind, because the railways won't make any separate arrangement. But because they travel together in the train, it doesn't follow, you see, that their life in the villages, vis-a-vis -vis the Hindus, has in any sense changed, you see. Whenever the Hindu and the untouchable alights at a railway train, you see, you see, they assume their old robes, you see. So you would say uh, Gandhi was an orthodox Hindu? Yes, he was Hindu. absolutely an orthodox Hindu. You see, I thought he was never a reformer. You see. And he has no dynamics in him. You see. All this talk about untouchability was just for the purpose of making the untouchables drawn into the Congress. That was one thing. You see. And secondly, you see, he wanted <coughs> that the untouchables should not oppose his movement, you see, of Swaraj, you see. I don't think beyond that he had any real motive of uplift, you see. He wasn't like Garrison in the United States who fought for the Negroes. And then do you think that um, a political independence would have come uh, uh, without, without Gandhi? Oh, yes, I'm sure about it. I, it might have been in slow degrees. But I personally myself think that if Swaraj had come in slow degrees in India, it would have profited the people better, you see. For each community or each group, you see, which is suffering from many of these disabilities, you see, would have been able to consolidate itself at each stage of the transfer of power from the British, you see. Today, the whole thing came as a flood. You see, people were unprepared. And I always think that the Labour Party has been the most stupid party in England. Or was it Gandhi who was <coughs> too, imp too impatient or the Congress Party? Was he? No, I, uh, personally, I do not know how suddenly Mr. Attlee agreed, you see, to give independence. That's a matter of secret which Mr. Attlee one day, I think, will disclose in his autobiography. How he came to do that, you see, because nobody ever expected this is such a sudden change of front. Nobody ever expected. It seems to me, from the analysis that I make about it, there are two things which I think led, you see, to the Labour Party to take this decision. One is the national army that was raised by Subhash Chandra Bose. 
the British had been ruling this country in the firm belief that whatever may happen, you see, in this country, and whatever the politician may do, you see, they will never be able, you see, to change the loyalty of the soldier. That was the one prop on which they were carrying on their administration. Now that thing was completely dashed to pieces, you see, when they found that even the soldier was being seduced, you see, and to form a party or a, or a battalion to blow off the British. Then I think the British came to the conclusion that if they were to rule India, the only basis on which they could rule was the maintenance of the British army. Going back to the year 1857, when the Indian soldier rebelled against the East India Company. And they found that it would never be possible for the British to supply India with enough European troops, you see, to keep their hold on it. You see, secondly, I myself think, I have no evidence, but I think the British soldier wanted the disbandment of the army immediately so that they wanted to go to their civil jobs. You see, the gradual, you know how much, uh, how much uh, indignation there was at this gradual disbandment of the army. Because those who were not disbanded felt that those who were disbanded were going to take their jobs. What is going to happen to them? You see, therefore they could not, you see, think of having a, enough of a British army to keep India down. You see, and besides they had thought, I think, thirdly, that after all, what they gained from India was commerce, was commerce, and not so much the uh, civil servant salary or the army uh, income. They were small things, and they had better be sacrificed for the sake of keeping something which was much more profitable namely trade and commerce, because whether India remained independent or India became, I mean, accepted dominion status or something lesser than that, you see, uh, the uh, trade and commerce would go on, just the same. I think, personally myself, I have no authority for that, but that is the way the work, the mind of the Labour Party then. You see. Now, you're casting your mind back to the... Uh Pune attack, the, the Europe that time. Yes. Can you uh, remember a little of um, what uh, Gandhi said to you and what you said to him? Oh, I, I, I know it very well. I know it very well. You see, Miss, the British government had in the original award which MacDonald had given, you see, had accepted my suggestion. I said, look here, the Hindus want you see, that there should be a common electorate, so that there will be no separatist feeling between the Shadrug caste and the Hindus. We think that if you have a common electorate, we would be submerged, you see, and the nominees of the Shadrug caste who would be elected, who would be really slaves of the Hindus, not independent people. Now, I, I told Mr. Ramsay MacDonald that this is a sort of a thing, you see, that he might do. Give us a separate elected, you see, give us a separate elected and also give us a second vote in the general election, you see, so that Gandhi cannot say that we are separated in point of election. First of all, my contention was this, that for five years, you see, we live separately from the Hindus with no kind of intercourse or intercommunication you see, of a social or a spiritual sort, you see. What can one day's cycle of participation, you see, in a common electorate do to remove this hardened crust, you see, of separatism, which has grown for centuries? It's a foolish thing to think that if two people vote together, you see, in a common polling booth, you see, that their hearts are going to change. It's nothing of the kind. Mr. Mr. Gandhi has got this madness in him. Well, let this be satisfied, you see, by this kind of a system. Give the untouchables two votes, you see, and give them a population uh, representation of ratio. 
so that the weightage would be in terms of votes and not in terms of uh, representative, so that the Gandhi and others may not complain. You see, that Ramsey MacDonald accepted. You see, the award was really my suggestion. I wrote to him a letter from Naples, you see, that this is what I would like him to do, you see, so that there may be no trouble. And this is exactly what he did, you see, gave us a separate elector and also a vote in the general elector, you see. But Gandhi didn't want that we should send our two representatives, you see. Therefore, he didn't want the separate uh, electorate uh, part of the award and went on fast, you see, went on fast. Then they all came to me you see, and said, well, the British government said, if he agrees, you see, to abandon the award, then we have no objection, you see. But we can't abandon the award ourselves. We have given the award, we have taken all things into consideration, and we think this is the basis. You ought to read Ramsey MacDonald's letter. It's a very clear statement that we haven't done anything to aggravate the separation. You see, in fact, we are trying to bridge it up by bringing the two sections together in a common electoral role. But Gandhi's object was that we should not get, you see, free independent representation. Therefore, he in the first place, he said, no representation ought to be given to us. That's how he stand in the round table conference, you see. He said, I recognize only three communities, you see, namely Hindus, you see, Muslims and Sikhs. These are the only three communities that will have a political recognition, you see, in the constitution, you see. But the Christians or the Anglo-Indians or the scheduled caste will have no place in the constitution. They must merge themselves in the general community. That was the stand that he had taken. Well, all his friends, I know, you see, were asking him, how foolish was his attitude? You see, his own friends had quarreled with him on this subject. That if you are prepared to give, you see, special representation to the Sikhs and special representation to the Muslims, who are thousand times superior in strength, you see, and political and economic stamina, how can you deny it, you see, to the Shirud caste or to the Christian, you see? He always used to say, oh, you don't understand our problem, you see. That's all he was saying. Alexander even, who was a great friend of his, had a serious quarrel with him, as he told me. Then the French woman, who was his disciple, I forget her name now, you see, she also had a great quarrel with him. That we don't understand this attitude. Either you say, we won't give anything to anybody. Let there be just a common role. You see, then we can understand that. That that's a democratic thing. You see? But to go on saying that you will give it to the Muslim, you see, and you give it to the Sikhs, you see, but not to the scheduled caste seems absurd. You see, he could give no answer. He could give no answer. So we suggested this method. But he also didn't, in the first beginning, in the beginning, when he wrote about <coughs> Ramji he said, no, the scheduled caste should have nothing. No representation. You see. Then his own friend said to him, this was asking for too much. You see, nobody would support you in this matter. Then Malviya and others came to me and said, well, um, could you not help us to solve this problem? You see, I said, well, I, I don't want to solve this problem by sacrificing what we have been able to get from the British Premier. So you went to... Uh, I, uh, I said I suggested an uh, alternative formula. And that formula was that I am not prepared to give up the separate electorate, but I am go I'm prepared you see, to modify the thing, you see, in this way, namely, that the candidates who would stand in the final election on behalf of the scheduled caste should be first elected by the scheduled caste themselves, sort of a primary election, you see, and that they should elect four people, you see, four, and the four then should stand in the general elected, you see, and let a, let the best one come, you see, so that we get some assurance that you don't put up, you see, your own nominees, you see, but that we do get people who will uh, express our voice in the, in the parliament. That Mr. Gandhi had to accept. So 
so he accepted that. You see? Of course, we had the benefit of it only in one election in 1937. You see? There you will see that the Federation swept the poll. Gandhi was not able to get a single candidate of his party elected. Well, did he, did he bargain very hard at the end of his past? Oh, of course. He? he bargained and bargained. I said nothing doing. You see, I'm prepared to save your life, you see, provided you do not make hard terms, you see. But I'm not going to save your life at the cost of the life of my people, you see. This is too much. I have, I have, how much I have labored, you see, in all this, I know very well. And I'm not going to sacrifice your whim, I sacrifice our people's interest, just for the sake of satisfying you, you, it's a huge whim, you see. How can one day's common election alter the situation? Simply cannot alter the situation. So what did he say to that? Ah, oh, he couldn't say anything. You see, he couldn't say anything. He was very much afraid, you see, that the Sharu caste would be a sort of a, as independent a body as the Sikhs and the Muslims were. And that the Hindus would be left alone to fight a battle against the combination of these three sections. That was what was at the, at the back of his mind. And he didn't want the Hindus to be left without any allies. You so see? really he, was, it was, uh, he worked entirely as a politician. As a politician. He was never a Mahatma, and I refused to call him Mahatma. You see, I've never in my life called him Mahatma. He doesn't deserve that title. Not even from the point of view of his morality. You see?